welcome, very big welcome to you all to ODI. I'm delighted to see so many people here today. My apologies for the temperature in this room. <laughs> we, are, we are doing our best. Um, <laughs> Welcome to our Global Challenges event on Leave No One Behind. Um, as well as the very full house that we have here in the room, we have about 350 people watching online. So a big welcome to all of you, um, wherever in the world you are. And please, um, particularly to those of you watching online, once we move through the speeches and into the questions, you're very welcome, indeed encouraged, to submit questions um, via the chat panel, and I have an iPad down here on my desk through which I'll be able to see your questions. And also, please tweet. No event these days is complete without a hashtag. <laughs> so let me um, also invite you to tweet using the um, hashtag Global Challenges. Um, before we move to the presentations, um, and before I even introduce the panelists, we're going to watch a short video um, produced by some of our colleagues here in ODI, which just reminds us of the reality of some of the people that we're going to be talking about today. Can we have the video, please? Kiyo <laughs> Saha chang ya masa ni ma bela nche kan che klas. Minera abju sa ni biya huma adabu zel tama. Kanda po na pon chang yuan polo. Abusa la biha ya mo. Ka biha yin chen shukuro. Ya tama ba chen shukuro. Nda na mali ya ma. Su kan chen puhu na kaman suye tu ma pon tuwa chanta na son. O tama. Kan kana kan menin bi ma ati dira. Banda do a mam darken power nest six to seven years. Back and as you go, doesn't you know you may you can be for coming in school, mamma like in school and laughing naked. Nelan Kayama, the young as our zelling or some bandama. Nuncunzan, a chunk more than number two, or so can zelling or some band. Kubwa <laughs> Then I came to school and bought a mall and business and a family can come here that they are a muksuk. The bumming and a gossip. So sometimes I have a gossip man here, then I came on board a muku in school. Kay Wahala can go. very much indeed. So, welcome again to ODI. My name is Claire Malamed and I am the Director of the Poverty and Inequality Programme here at ODI. I'm delighted to see many uh, members of, of that programme and, and other colleagues from ODI in the room as well as our um, big audience. Um, I think at ODI we um, feel that this idea, this concept of leave no one behind is is particularly important for two reasons. First of all, because it focuses 
political attention where it most needs to be on the poorest people, the people who, in a sense, have the most entitlement to the support of the international community of other countries, have the, the entitlement to the most support and concern um, from the rest of the world. But secondly, I think the concept of leave no one behind, for me at least, is particularly powerful because it focuses attention on them as people, not as amorphous numbers. Um, or percentages, or it very much it encourages a sort of focus of academic research, of policy, um, and of advocacy and campaigning on people as people, and a real attention <coughs> to the specific circumstances into, in which they live, and the reasons, the many complicated social, economic, and political reasons why they are being left mm -hmm. behind, and the forces that combine to make that so. So I think we were pleased and excited to see that as one of the um, ideas which really came to the fore early on in the whole um, ye the several years of negotiations around the Sustainable Development Goals. And again, are pleased to see that it's one of the things which has really stuck, one of the ideas which seems to be have a large amount of political traction um, and has really stuck. And um, a few weeks ago when the... Um, report of the UN Secretary General came out outlining his ideas for how the what's called the follow-up and review the, the sort of way that the new goals will be monitored leave no one behind again was very much at the center of that thinking and it's proposed to be the, the sort of one of the key ideas that will be discussed and evaluated and monitored at the first meeting of the high-level political forum the sort of apex of the SDG monitoring structure later this year in July. So I think we now have an opportunity to really think what we want to do with this, in a sense, present that we have given, that we have been given. All of this think all of this ideas, this political attention, this focus on leave no one behind. It is a moment to think about how it can actually be used in practical ways to affect policy, to affect programming, to hold governments to account in different ways. Um, and to do that through the lens of what will benefit the very poorest people and groups. Of course, it's not a moment that will last forever, so it's important mm. that we do take this opportunity now to capitalise <coughs> on this moment, set, put in place the policies, the programmes, the resource flows that will make sure that these commitments are maintained, even when it is some other catchy phrase which is hogging the political limelight. Um, I think we, we all feel a kind of sense of responsibility to make use of this, of this moment and a sense of excitement and opportunity of how to do that. And that is very much the agenda for today. So I um, am going to quickly introduce the panel. First of all, um, on my far left, absolutely delighted and excited to welcome Minister um, Lillian Pluman, the Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation of the Netherlands, um, here, at the OBC, here to, to ODI. The government of the Netherlands have been great supporters of our much of <laughs> ODI's work in different ways over the years, so we're mm. particularly delighted to welcome the minister here today. Then um, <coughs> on, on my left, uh, Charles <coughs> Bougre, who is the CEO of the uh, Savannah Accelerated <coughs> Development Authority, um, and also, uh, this is the grassroots level, and also at the national level, a member of the National Development Planning Commission in Ghana. So has a, a sort of both a, a national and a local view of the, the policy making process in that country and a former colleague of mine at Christian Aid. So very happy to, to welcome Charles back, back here. And then um, next to me is uh, my colleague Elizabeth Stewart, a research fellow and um, the leader of our work here at ODI on the Sustainable Development Goals. But uh, first of all, let me, uh, without further ado, welcome our star guest, Lillian Plowman, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Happy to see so many people here and um, watching us closely. Um, combating inequality in developing countries. That's what you expect me to talk about today. And I will, because it's a crucial issue, as we just heard. But inequality is not something that only affects poor countries. Inequality affects all of us. I live in Amsterdam, where house prices are now rising so sharply 
that ordinary, hardworking people don't get a look in. Here in London, I hear it, it has been like that for years. Whole neighborhoods are unaffordable. Century-old football clubs have become the playthings of billionaires. The trend is manifest. More and more of the world's wealth is in the hands of fewer people. Recently, there was a heated debate on just how many billionaires it takes to equal the assets of 40% of the world's population. But whether it's 62, two busloads full, or even several hundred, the point is clear. There is something very wrong with the world. I believe that tolerating this growing inequality will go down in history as humankind's biggest mistake since communism. The myth of communism was that people could be made equal and that a system as complex as the economy could be planned centrally. No scope was offered for individual initiatives or differences. Total uniformity was the suffocating dogma. Unfortunately, the misconceptions that have prevailed since the fall of the Berlin Wall aren't so different to those of communism. Trickle-down economics proved to be just as big a myth. The more billionaires, the merrier, was the thinking. Let them have their penthouses and mega yachts. After all, their wealth is bound to trickle down, right? They'll invest their spare cash in the world around them, so we will all benefit in the end. What's more, the example set by these winners will inspire others to make something of their lives, right? Wrong. Arguments for high levels of inequality are self-serving, not self-evident. The, evident the evidence against such arguments is mounting. Take the fascinating stub study published recently by Burkhauser, De Neve, and Pautevi of the London School of Economics. Serious income inequality is an inspiration to no one, they argue. Instead, it makes us all less happy with our lives. One reason is that as the rich get very get richer, things get priced beyond the reach of even the relatively well-off middle class. Private schools and houses in the best neighborhoods are an example. Another reason, they argue, is that an increase in the share of income held by the richest 1% can make others feel that their chance of moving up the ladder and becoming rich themselves is getting beyond their reach. These findings by the London School of Economics <coughs> confirm what I've been suspecting for some time. Excessive inequality has no benefits at all to no one. In fact, it has disturbing effects, such as discouragement and depression. We are essentially social animal animals that are constantly relating to one another somehow. People can inspire each other, but they can also frustrate discourage and upset each other. And that's what growth inequality does, even in our prosperous part of the world. It unravels the very fabric of societies. It robs people of decent jobs and decent pay, and it robs them of their sense of purpose and self-worth. So much for the impact of inequality in our part of the world. Let's now move to the subject that brought us here today inequality in developing countries. Everything I've said applies to them too, times a thousand or so, <clears throat> because the gap between rich and poor is far bigger in developing countries. Inequality isn't a mere technical issue. It's not just a tire you can fix with the right tools and the right know-how and then get back on the road. Inequality is above all the result of political choices. And that means tackling it, is, tackling it is a political responsibility. Last autumn, the United Nations adopted new global goals. The challenges we face are summed up in the slogan, leave no one behind. And this meeting, I think, is very well timed. It provides the opportunity to discuss this political challenge at a political level. We can come up with good ideas on leave no one behind, and we can feed them into the UN process. And let me then also thanks the, thank the Overseas Development Institute for organizing this event. 
I'd like to thank Vice President uh, Chacon, Elizabeth Stewart, and Charles Abugra for their participation today. <laughs> so it's time to start discussing the next steps at a political level, because inequality is truly the mother of all crises. Whether it's conflict, climate change, economic stagnation, migration flows, inequality is always a major underlying factor. Leave no one behind can provide the answer, but only if we can turn our ambition into reality. Let's begin with the global goals. One of the main targets is to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030. To achieve that, we need two things. <clears throat> First, economic growth must stay at the level it had for the past 10 years. And second, the benefits of that growth must be far bigger than average for the poorest 40% of the people. There are compelling economic reasons to make that happen. I already mentioned the research that shows that rising inequality makes people less happy. And unhappiness comes with a price tag. It makes people less productive. An above average rise in the incomes of the top 20% can actually harm a country's economic growth. But raise the income of the lowest 10% by 50% and almost every penny of it will generate growth. In other words, investing in the poorest of the poor is the smartest eco economic policy there is. But if we don't, the consequences will be disastrous. There is no way we'll defeat extreme poverty by 2030, which means we won't generate the economic growth needed to achieve the other global goals, and we won't reach our climate goals either. So, leaving no one behind is a necessity. But more than that, I think it's a moral imperative. In the past 25 years, globalization has helped the world make spectacular progress on eradicating poverty. But at the same time, we've allowed too many people to lag behind, and even more to fall by the wayside completely. Almost a billion people still live on less than $1.90 a day. The developing world is where inequality is rising most. After Latin America, the most unequal equal distribution of income is now in Africa. And while inequality in Latin America is finally falling, in countries like Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria, we're seeing very sharp rises indeed. One of the main causes of that is exclusion, whether it's on the basis of gender, religion, disability, or sexual orientation, entire groups of people representing hundreds of millions of people, <laughs> women and men, are being left out. In many cases, globalization has hurt them more than it has helped. As development got its speed, those in the toughest situations those without access to education, to finance, to roads and communication technology had an even tougher time to catch up. It's worth returning here to the contrast between gross inequality and communism. The error of the communists was to assume that they could plan and manage everything. The mistake of those who championed laissez-faire is clear from the name alone. They thought the only choice was to let go, that you either couldn't or shouldn't try to manage globalization. But between those two extremes, there has always been a middle way. And the supporters of this approach, let's call it common sense, have always been in the majority. But as we look back on the past quarter century, we must come to a painful conclusion. We have not done enough to translate common sense into effective policy. We gave the market fundamentalists too much leeway and we allowed too many people to go left behind. And that's what leaving no one behind means to me, a much needed correction. It means finally managing globalization properly in policy terms. It means ending the unbridled power of the elites so that everyone can finally benefit from and participate in global development. 
and the poor should benefit more, much more than the rich. Here comes the good news. We know how to make that happen by promoting jobs, by building human capacity and by building infrastructure, by combating discrimination and exclusion, by redistributing wealth through taxes and transfers. Last year, we analyzed Dutch policy to see how we could contribute more to inclusive development. It resulted in a plan of action worth 350 million euros that we are now putting into practice. The plan consists of 20 measures, I'm not going to uh, name all of them, don't worry, of 20 measures in two areas. The first area, work for women and for young people, involves generating jobs and income for African women and young people with poor future prospects. The second area, dialogue for change, contains 10 measures to prompt robust political dialogue with developing countries on inclusive growth and development. I feel that that dialogue is crucial because resistance to change is often found precisely where change is needed most. In many poor countries, elites cling stubbornly to wealth and power until conflict, death and destruction are inevitable. And unfortunately, it's never the elite who pay the highest price. It's always the poorest of the poor. To tackle inequality effectively, we need, to know more, much, we need to know much more precisely where the problems lie. Technology and statistics can help here. The Netherlands will contribute by giving technical assistance to a range of bodies in developing countries. Our Bureau of Statistics Netherlands has a big reputation in this area. They know how to collect data on disadvantaged groups and we're offering its expertise to developing countries. This might seem rather technical, but it's actually very political. Many governments don't want to break data down by income, gender, location, or ethnicity. Or take disabled people. You won't find them in many statistics. That makes it easy to ignore their existence. And in situations like these, statistical data can be a very powerful weapon which can force change. But the most powerful weapon of all is tax. The study I mentioned earlier by Burkhauser, De Neve, and Pautovi contains an intriguing graph. In the top left corner, you can see Denmark, the Netherlands, and Sweden. Yep, there they are. We certainly have our problems, but relatively speaking, this part of the world is an oasis of calm. In these countries, the top 1% controls 6 to 7% of total income. Now look at South Africa in the bottom right corner at the other end of the spectrum. It's one of the most violent countries on earth. There are many possible reasons and the past trauma of apartheid obviously is one of them. The even uglier flip side of in income inequality is another one, inequality between men and women. Estimations of the number of women and girls raped yearly range between almost 400,000 and a half million. In the context of what we are talking about today, however, one factor is especially compelling. The richest 1% in South Africa owns more <clears throat> than 17% of the country's total income. The lesson here seems clear. First, governments have to make good on promises to fight tax avoidance and tax evasion. The base erosion and profit shifting project of the G20 and the OECD is a major step forward. My country, the Netherlands, has initiated the renegotiation of 23 tax treaties with developing countries. We've proposed anti-abuse uh, provisions to ensure that the Netherlands is no longer an attractive option for companies that want to avoid taxes. So far, four treaties have been signed. And since January 1st, we have been foregoing tax exemptions on goods and services provided under official development assistance. Second, we need to broaden the tax base in developing countries. Again, this might sound technical, but again, it's very political. In developing countries, the poor often pay a higher proportion in tax than the rich. That's grossly unfair. 
The main reason is that it's easy to tax consumption. Countries need a progressive tax regime. And for that, they need assistance in administering and collecting more complex forms of taxation, such as income and wealth taxes. From a moral standpoint alone, all this is long overdue. But from an economic perspective too, it would be downright foolish not to act. Righting these wrongs through fair, fair, through fair taxation boils down to investing in the poor. And as we saw earlier, there is no smarter investment than that. Helping countries collect taxes has a huge rate of return, well over a factor of 10. But it only works if governments are willing to tax the most well-off. Another way of putting it is leave no one too far ahead. Once again, it comes down to politics. Taxation uh, is not a popular subject for politicians, but it does deserve much more attention. Remember again the lesson of Burkhauser, the Neve, and Pauteve. Higher taxation equals more happiness. In the Netherlands, the average tax burden is 30-something percent. In Scandinavia, it's in the high 40s. I wish the same for every country. No successful nation without taxation, provided the money is well spent, of course. For many developing countries, the current tax burden is still somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of GDP. According to the UN, they'll have to raise collection to about 20 percent just to be able to finance their share of the global goals. So, we have our work cut out for us. At July's high-level political forum, we'll talk about the follow-up and monitoring of the global goals. Leaving no one behind will be the overarching theme here. And during the forum, I will host a meeting on concrete ways to approach that. In other words, how can we make sure that those furthest behind are reached first? We will need firm agreements on the reviewing process and on ways to intervene if progress is lacking. And above all, as I hope my remarks today have made clear, we will need political courage. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, we need nothing less than a paradigm shift. To the two busloads of billionaires, I say, trickle down is dead. To the elites and the kleptocrats in dirt poor countries, I say, there's a limit to how high you can build the gates around your communities. The time has come to pay. Make sure the payment is in taxes. Fair taxes, that's all the world is asking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Great, uh, particularly happy to hear you mention the importance of data. Um, and a, a you know, square focus there on some of the difficult political issues that need to be tackled for this agenda to be realised. It's, it's not an easy thing. Before I turn to the panel, we are very um, happy to also have for you today a video message from um, Her Excellency Ana Helena Chajon, the Vice President of Costa Rica, a country obviously which has very high ambitions um, in this area. Let, can we watch the video? Thank you. Greetings. First, I would like to thank the Overseas Development Institute as well as the authorities of the Netherlands and Great Britain and Northern <laughs> Ireland for your kind invitation. I regret not being able to accompany you. However, my agenda requires me to remain at my country, Costa Rica. Today our aspiration must be to create a world where human rights are not just for the privileged, where every person has a decent living standards and are able to pursue their happiness. This is why one of the most ethical challenges in our time is to reduce extreme poverty and social inequalities. There is no doubt that this form of exclusion and structural causes and core decades ago by policies that concentrate wealth in order to reverse that, last year, we started to implement a new strategic for taking extreme poverty known as Puente al Desarrollo, meaning bridge to development. 
We are not waiting for people to ask for help. We are sending professionals to the streets in the 75 districts that have the most concentrated poverty in order to attend those who most needed it. Costa Rica is now promoting different types of skills and welfare. As well, we are tracking the progress of the families with limited resources. It is becoming more important to target poverty geographically. On the other hand, under Understanding the intersectorality of poverty is key to direct policy efficiently. For, for example, female-headed households have particular vulnerabilities. They represent 40% of all households in poverty in Costa Rica. Therefore, we are working to improve their access to formal economy and to prevent teenage pregnancies. However, in order to ensure no one is left behind, we are doing much more. For instance, we reformed a bureau that looks the right of persons with disability in order to promote more participation. And at the same time, we are pushing for subsidies to allow persons with disability to live an autonomous life. Historically excluded population like LGTBE and HIV positive persons now have specialized public health services. The government of Costa Rica published an executive decree that acknowledged the same rights for this population in the executive branch. Now we are the only country in Central America that guarantees same-sex couples' rights for insurance and paid leave. Indeed, sustainable development goals show us a path to a better world in which no one is left behind. Recently, on COP21, countries show the commitment to clear goals on environmental issues. Now, it is our chance for giving the challenges of poverty and inequity the same importance and priority. If we want to target inequality and improve social well-being, we need a welfare state. We need a strong policies that will not only provide for those who are excluded, but also create real opportunities required for every person to follow their own path in life. There is a long road. Let's take a step ahead forward. Thank you very much for sharing our dreams. I send you a big hug from Costa Rica. Thank you very much. Now let me um, turn now to, um, to Charles Abugre. Charles. We obviously can see from both the Minister and the Vice President's um, addresses, this is a huge agenda. There is, a, I would suspect, an almost infinite range of policies and legal changes and economic changes that we might want to see to achieve this ambition to leave no one behind. But from your perspective, both at the national and at the local level in Ghana, what should be the priorities? What needs to change first if we're going to achieve leaving no one behind by 2030. Uh, thanks, Claire. And uh, thanks, uh, Minister Lillian. Uh, I think uh, first, your remarks, uh, you know, um, makes, when I reflect back at my life in the UK, mm. uh, that being a tax justice zealot was not entirely <laughs> in vain. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, oh, sorry. You can't it's hear. It's um, OK, I shall uh, get going. Um, first and foremost, the leave no one behind no. norm uh, is not a done deal. It's. Um, I think it's working, but if you need, if you, if we give you a handheld, then you can be a bit freer to to move around and look at the whole room. <laughs> okay. It, it's it's not a done deal. It's an issue by itself that needs campaigning. It's a norm that cannot be taken for granted, uh, because in our many of the countries where this is most needed. We are all increasingly democracies of a sort, with some growing middle classes, with 
various aspirations. Large numbers of young people out of school, some out of tertiary school, looking for jobs that they cannot find. And therefore, the definition of what it means to leave no one behind is the first issue that we confront uh, at the national level. Inequalities. The example of Ghana is a telling one. In the last decade or so, per capita incomes have increased, but so has inequalities, both at the national, but also, interestingly, in the districts with the highest levels of poverty incidence. At the national level, we think that what has driven inequalities is that the growth of incomes have been in areas where fewer boats are lifted. Where has the growth of incomes been? It's been in finance, banking and insurance. It's been high-end real estate, which is in the construction sector. And it's been in uh, wholesale trading, which is largely import-driven. The areas where incomes have grown the least is in agriculture, especially food sector agriculture. It's been in public service and public service at the front line. And it's been in manufacturing, where there is a manufacturing sector. Where the majority of people have been, including retail trade, income has grown the least. Therefore, although there has been growth, inequality is driven by the structure of growth itself. And therefore, it brings us to an important question. Where do we place our emphasis? Changing the structure of the economy or addressing the immediate need of extreme poverty? It's a dilemma that we have to address. And there are trade-offs, uh, especially in the short to medium term. In the long term, the trade-off is much easier. That is when incomes are fairly distributed, consumption-driven growth will tend to lift the boat equally high. But in the short to medium term, the trade-offs are stuck. My, I work in the part of our country that is the poorer neighbor. The savannah it occupies more than 54% of the land area of Ghana. It's the northern half of Ghana. The northern half of Ghana is the poorer half of Ghana. It is largely rain-fed, agriculture-led economy. Some of the districts have up to 85% of the people living in extreme poverty. And it is mainly in most of these districts that the Gini coefficient is equally the highest. What is driving this? Well, in this type of inequality, it is largely the pervasiveness of po po poverty. Basically, so many people are so down there that the few that are high up above the poverty line basically drags the Gini coefficient upwards. It brings us back then to the question again of the trade-offs between narrow targeting, which is, as you can see in the video which was captured, was also in my zone uh, in northern Ghana where you see extreme poverty stuck in your face that you have to address. But you also see that that is also a reflection of a large now percentage of the population, many of whom are barely better than the ones that have been, uh, been focused. So your question was, where do we start uh, first? Unfortunately, in most poor countries, we don't have this simple option. You have to try to do everything at the same time. You have to try and set a vision of transformation, which changes the hope to change the structure of the economy with time, and you have to try to target what you have at the moment, both narrowly 
and broadly. Narrowly, narrowly in the sense of fishing out the poor. The poor are located in sectors and in space of the economy. And so in space, probably easier to target. In the sectors, probably more difficult to target narrowly. So those who are earning very low incomes at the sectoral level, it suggests that targeting has to be broad-based. Social protection measures that are universal in nature. Now, this is very hard for a, a, most economies facing serious fiscal crisis. And my country, for example, is currently deep in the middle of an IF pro, IMF program that only allows you know, for some social protection measures and very little for investment in infrastructure and energy that eventually changes the structure of the economy. But you have to try to do both, one way uh, or the other. Now, this brings us to the importance of uh, data. This is absolutely critical, and I, I know that Liz will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, first and foremost, we went into the MDGs with a very weak database. We have emerged from the MDGs one way or the other with not too strong databases. We have slightly better household information, uh, which is generated from living standard surveys. In most countries, you have up to five to six years gaps in that data. You have to extrapolate. In most cases where you can only extrapolate closely, if you want to do local level poverty, will be to use population censuses. Population census data in most African countries are 10 years old. Therefore, extrapolating from them are themselves problematic. So the data systems are immense. They have to become universal and multisectoral. Universal and multisectoral to set the baseline. The baseline to go forward, but also the baseline to establish the gaps between the now, the populations for now, and the future. That is in 15 years time, when nobody ought to be left behind. You are talking about multi-sector databases, data systems, education, healthcare, per capita incomes, water, environment, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. This is massive, but yet we have to do. The important thing though is that, uh, that's the good news, is that data collection systems have improved with technology. We can now generate these data strongly using the mobile telephone. And we can locate the poor uh, through G uh, G uh, uh, G GPS lo lo uh, location technology, GIS systems. We have to deploy these massively across many of the developing countries in order to establish the basis so that five years down the line, we are not quarreling about where we are all starting from and where we are going, going to. So I'm happy to hear Minister Lillian's point that they would deploy, possibly deploy the support of the Dutch Statistical Service. They have to catch up with the use of mobile telephony mm -hmm. and other systems in data collection uh, and analysis. So this is absolutely critical. But in the meantime, we have to build targeting systems. And targeting systems, especially for social protection, uh, which is various common household registries that uh, many countries are beginning to learn from Brazil. These common registries are important for a start because it will allow us to deploy in a more focused way health measures, cash transfer systems, um, you know, and health insurance schemes, education for the poor, water targeting systems, and so on and so forth. So for a start, if we can start to build on these common registry systems and start on that basis, to start to encourage slightly both a combination of narrow targeting, making sure that what exists homes down on those who most need it, and broader targeting, which is the debate for universality, is very critical. One more minute. And that is to take you to the national. I have said all of these about local, more or less. But some of these relate to the national. In Africa, we have the SDGs to align with. We also have Africa 2063 to align with. Many of them align, but not neatly. Africa 2063 goals, some of them are treated as drivers in the SDGs. For example, 
the transformation of the economies of, the, of, 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 the, of, of, of Africa, which is really about the long term, making sure that there's increased productivity in agriculture and that there's an increasing share of manufacturing in GDP. There's an increasing share in value-added agriculture in GDP, and so on and so forth. And th that is a, that's an essential, central part. And that drives the thinking of most countries. So even while they are facing problems, they will borrow massively internationally and domestically to invest in their infrastructure and energy. Those alignment questions, as I said, need to be debated and discussed. That's why leave no one behind is not yet a, a total done deal. In global partnerships, global partnerships concepts are moving more and more towards public-private partnerships. Now, the private sector has a lot of good to do, but the private sector is not cheap. I know this for sure, uh, w working in a poorer part of the country trying to attract foreign investment. To attract them there, we have to incur more debt. The risks are supposed to be so high that you have to take additional bedding of state to be able to attract the private sector. And therefore, the state is taking on more and more debt through guarantee mechanisms in order to have the private sector come in. If you don't have the guarantee mechanisms, you have only BOT systems to deal with, build, operate, and transfer, which is essentially about privatization infrastructure, which have them o their own problem because they're long-term concessioning of, 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 of infrastructure, which generates new political problems. Therefore, as we pick these issues forward, there is a lot of both political and practical issues of debate to take forward. Thank you, Charles. A really great um, grounding of this into the, the practical realities and a reminder that this agenda is both one of public services and welfare, but also critically of economic growth and transformation. Let me now turn to, uh, to Liz to talk a little bit about um, some recent ODI work in this area, touching both on the issues of data that have already been mentioned, um, and more broadly on the sort of the broader perspective around government actions, Liz. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Can you can you hear me in this microphone? Is this one working? No. Mm. This? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Claire. Thanks very much, Charles. Thank you, Minister Pluman, and thanks very much to Vice President Chacon as well. Um, and can I just add my um, delight and excitement that leave no one behind is gaining this political mm. consensus, that, that this is the transformative aspect of the SDGs. I'm also very excited that there seems to be an emerging political consensus around the idea of a, a thousand day agenda. Um, this is often we talk about when politicians come into office, they have a first hundred days and they're expected to deliver some tangible mm. results that will put down foundations for further action in the future. This is a global agenda, so a thousand days seems mm. fairer. Takes us quite conveniently to September 2018, to UNGA 2018 in three years' time. If you're wondering what that clock is, that's it ticking down to remind us of the urgency of the action. We're on day 39 of our thousand days. And if, and I think we're, we're I assume everyone would be in agreement here, that some of the heaviest lifting to be done in the SDGs is around the Leave No One Behind agenda, we better get on with it. There's a real sense of urgency. So um, as Charles has said, one of the biggest issues is locating the poor and marginalized people in space. Um, it's become a truism now that there are big data gaps in developing countries. I have to say in developed countries as well, but particularly in, developed in developing countries and particularly around the poorest and most marginalized groups. And it's clear that before governments can um, deliver the kind of policies that are necessary to enable people not just to depend on the government for the provision of services or to depend on NGOs, but to be able to engage fully in the economy themselves and have jobs and make their own life choices, um, then the, you know, the government needs to know who they are, what they look like, what they need, what they're getting at the moment, etc. W today we're launching, we've, we've done at ODI an illustrative exercise to try and do exactly that. We're, and we're launching this, these pieces of research today. They're outside three reports, three regional reports on, um, you know, who are the leave no one behind, the left behind. Um, we've 
uh, we've um, established a methodology to both identify marginalized groups, but also describe their progress or lack of progress against a set of SDG indicators. And mm -hmm. we've used household surveys. We've used some panel data where, where it's available. There's some good disability panel data in Bangladesh, for instance. Um, and, and we've pulled this together into these studies. So we're basically setting out the probability of having a certain characteristic according to being a member of a certain, a certain group, a particular group. So we've, we've looked at two countries per region. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, we've looked at Nigeria and Benin. For Asia, we've looked at Bangladesh and Vietnam. And for Latin America, we've looked at Brazil and Guatemala. And there's some very interesting findings. I'm going to just highlight three of them, but I hope that you will pick up copies of the report and, and engage in some of the extremely rich detail that's in them. Um, the first thing is that's very striking. So although we've looked across a range of different groups, so we've looked at age, ethnicity, um, kind of urban, rural, so sort of spatial inequalities, um, religious you know, uh, inequalities according to, to, to one's religion, gender, what struck me is actually the prevalence of ethnicity and how important ethnicity seems to be as a key driver of um, these obstacles to progress. So, for instance, in Nigeria, Fulani people are eight times more likely than Yoruba people to have no access to sanitation or very low levels of access to sanitation, three times more likely to have not really had a substantial education and more than twice as likely to be in their bottom wealth quintile. Um, Brazil, similar kind of finding. Actually, the Afro-Brazilians in Brazil, they're now in the numerical majority, but they continue to be a minority socially, culturally, <laughs> economically, politically. Now, some of the, there has been a, something of a closing of the absolute gaps between the Afro-Brazilian communities, populations, and the white populations. But still, you are 1.6 times more likely to be living in poverty if you're an Afro-Brazilian in Brazil at the moment. The second finding, which I found really interesting, was just how fine-grained and nuanced this analysis needs to be if governments and NGOs are really to be able to understand, you know, what does this marginalization mean? What does it look like? What is the lived reality of people? I mean, Claire, you talked about seeing people as individuals rather than numbers. Mm. This is, you know, really getting into this kind of detail. So, for example, in Bangladesh, there's a difference between the way in which um, de jure female-headed households, that is, um, households headed by women who are, who've never been married or they're separated or they're widowed, um, and the way in which households, which are de facto female-headed households, so maybe the husband, the partner, is a migrant worker and he's mostly away from home. And the former is 1.9 times more likely to be living in poverty than the latter, although that gap is, that gap's changing. Similarly, in Vietnam, the government has tried to target policies that will close um, some, of the, some of the inequalities. So they've made... They've made... Um, They've made irrigation free to access in rural areas. The problem is that people from the minority, ethnic minorities, um, tend to live in the upland areas where it's very difficult to provide this irrigation, so they're not getting it. The kin majority live in the lowland areas and are getting it, so actually it's having a perverse outcome. Um, thirdly, just briefly, just a positive note, actually these studies have uncovered stories of progress. So although we talked about increasing um, income inequality in sub-Saharan Africa, actually, although there are still very high levels of income and wealth inequality in <coughs> Benin, they're actually, um, those gaps are closing, which is, which is positive. Bangladesh, um, again, very positive example of some um, government policies on gender, so um, the paying of stipend to girls to attend secondary school and removal of user fees for girls to go to primary school in rural areas, that's having um, really positive outcomes on, um, on uh, positive impact on gender outcomes. So, you know, it's not all a negative story. There's some really good stuff in there as well. So we're, we're really hoping that this methodology is going to be useful. It's going to be taken up by governments. And these, this kind of study is going to be replicated as the starting point for the Leave No One Behind agenda. Now, we were um, inhibited in these studies by exactly the, the kind of data gaps that I've talked about earlier and Charles has referred to and everyone's, everyone's talked about. 
So for example, in Vietnam, um, it wasn't possible to really sort of disaggregate and look at the difference between outcomes for different ethnic minorities because the sample size was too small. In some cases, we weren't even clear that we were actually looking at the right groups or the right indicators. Mm -hmm. It could be that in Guatemala, say, that mental health issues were something that was a driver of, of, of lack of progress, um, for, for want of a better expression. But we don't know because we don't have the data. So, you know, if this methodology is going to be taken up, it would need to be complemented by using... Um, community-based monitoring, where that's their participatory research, where you're listening to the voices of the community, um, either directly or mediated through, through an NGO. Um, just one final point, if I may. This, clearly, a key objection to this approach is that you're assuming a certain level of political buy-in and political goodwill from the government to undertake this exercise. And as we all know, there are some countries around the world that aren't Costa Rica, for instance, um, where it's the government itself who is, has institutionalized this marginalization through its legis legislative agenda, the most obvious area for this being anti-homosexuality legislation in some countries. So, I mean, it's clear that we're not going to get this happening in every single country, but I think it's also clear that in the medium term, the global pressure and scrutiny that's brought to bear by the SDGs and the fact that there are, they are going to be, I think... Um, changing the normative environment. You know, it's not going to be acceptable for gender norms to be, to look like they are in five years' time, in f 10 years' time, in 15 years' time, as they do today in some countries. So this kind of global pressure will make it much harder for those governments to carry on um, in tr that sort of entrenched uh, marginalisation where they're the ones who are actually doing the entrenching. Thank you, Thanks. Liz. Thank you, Liz, and let me also thank uh, my colleagues who were uh, part of the research team for these papers. I see many of them in the room, Tambi, Chiara, Laura, and Emma. Um, congratulations, and Tom, Tom, are you? Ah, Tom is here too, fantastic, I didn't see you. Uh, congratulations to all of you, this is really great and useful work. Um, so we've heard now, I think, a kind of variety of the, the scale, I think probably slightly alarmingly, has been the scale of the challenge has been... Uh, laid out very clearly for us this morning. To start with, um, the, the scale of the information gaps, the things that we don't know, um, which are themselves a barrier to progress. And I think, you know, it's important to understand the role that data plays here, not simply, you know, as, as the minister said, it's partly a technical, um, a, a technical input into good policy making, into good evaluation. It's an essential part of the infrastructure, not only for monitoring the SDGs, but also for achieving them. One can't set up a new universal health system, for example, if you don't know where people are being born and what they are dying from. And this is the state of, of information um, in many countries and many districts within countries. But data is, is more than simply a technical infrastructure, a technical input. It is, and again, as I think this research shows, a different way of telling stories about people's lives. Just as words, we use words to tell the stories about people's lives that can create change in their own right, create the dynamic for change. So numbers also are a different way of telling those stories and illustrating the reality of the, of the world that we live in and the people in it. So I think, you know, one of the things that we're going to want to talk about in the rest of this morning is obviously data, but there is a huge amount more to it than that, as we've heard. There is the whole agenda around welfare, around the using, the using of public money in very deliberate and targeted, as we heard, ways to address the specific needs of the poorest people, be they a straightforward need for income, or for health services, for education, and so on. There's a big public sector welfare agenda here um, that this Leave No One Behind gives us the opportunity to really look at afresh and in a very focused and coordinated way. There is also, as we heard, a huge economic agenda. This is not just about welfare and the traditional doling out mm. of either public money or aid money on a sort of infinite loop. This is also about tackling some of the really difficult issues around economic transformation, both at a national level, around creating the kind of growth in the sectors of the economy which can benefit those, the very poorest people, but also at the level of groups 
and of um, and of individuals? How can people seize new opportunities and indeed create them for themselves? This is not only a passive thing. So I think there is there is a huge amount to talk about this morning. We have a very full room, which is fantastic to see. And uh, this is now your opportunity to. Um, to make comments, to put specific questions. If you'd like to address specific questions to any of the people on the panel, please do. If you want to, if you have a burning reaction to some of the things that have been said, that's very welcome too. But please be, be aware of the number of people who I'm sure are going to speak. Um, be kind to your colleagues. Um, and let's try to keep the, keep the questions very, very short, if we can. Um, and then we'll be able to include more of the people here in the room. So, let me see some hands, please. Who, oh my goodness. Okay, we're going to... <laughs> this is great. You've obviously woken everybody up despite the hot, despite the uh, heat in the room. Nobody's falling asleep, which is a good sign. So let me... Uh, I'm going to take them in batches in a sweep from uh, left to right on my side. So let me start here with the women here in the white T-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> 